tym razem przedmiotem spotkania będzie pewne bardzo ciekawe archiwum. Uh, we are going to be talking about an extremely interesting archive that we are talking, going to be talking about here. Let me introduce the participants of the panel. Dr. Tomasz Basiuk, the director of the American Studies Center at the Wolfson University. And in his uh, research, he is focusing on the queer uh, or gay topic. Um, Karol Radziszewski, an excellent Polish artist who shall be commenting on his own works. So I will not, uh, well, without further ado, I will like to proceed. Thank you, very, um, thank you very much. Good morning. I would want to say the following. I am a visual artist, and in a var variety of ways I use photography and video and others. But I would like to describe a very uh, unique video, excuse me, very unique work. As an artist for the past uh, couple of years, I have uh, been publishing the Dick Fagazine. It is an irregular, that is, it is a magazine that is not published on a regular basis, but it discusses issues of maleness and gayness in Europe and Central and European, in Central and Eastern Europe. I am going, well, the next issue is going to focus on the pre-1989 gay life in Central and Eastern Europe. It turned out that we are that while working on our pro project, we have been discovering more and more photographs uh, from people who have never been talking about it or publishing it or publishing their archives. So in our quest for visual materials and for theoretical materials and for people who could tell us something about those times, I had, been con I had received a contract uh, with uh, uh, a gentleman called Richard Kiesel, this is his bathroom and his photographs. It is a um, gentleman who lives in Gdańsk, and he uh, was the first uh, author of a zine magazine, gay magazine. First, uh, f first, that magazine had been published as a leaflet, brochure distributed for friends, and then it had developed to, to a magazine that could not exceed 100 uh, copies in circulation, otherwise it would have had to be censored. It started as a leaflet um, providing information on AIDS, so uh, it was protected against censorship uh, initially, and then it, it evolved into a mini-zine, a mini-zine magazine, as we called it. Uh, I had. Uh, I've uh, been uh, talking to Richard Kiesel for many years now. He is a typographer uh, by profession. I traveled to Gdańsk to talk to him. I had been slowly but surely uh, developing uh, a relationship with him, and you can see the Philo magazine. Um, uh, you can see a few fragments. And I. Um, and once when I went to see him, I th he told me, well, you might be interested. He pulled out from under his bed a plastic bag full of small boxes, and uh, they contained more than 300 slide, uh, slides that had never seen daylight for many years. And uh, uh, he had a whole collection of slides and I must say that I was absolutely fascinated. He showed the visual side of his archives. You, you can, I will show you those photographs. He showed, he, he told a visual history, a visual story that I had never encountered before. It is, that would be quite typical for the New York or British scene uh, for Western Europe, but those were not in any way typical uh, for our local culture. This collection is tremendous, is huge. It had become a point of entry for a project that had been, um, that had originated from archives but had then developed. Let me elaborate. Um, soon. I wanted to show you a selection of a number of sequences that um, constitute this collection of slides. Those slides were made in the years 1985-1986, and there had been the um, record of an informal activity 
in 19 in the 1980s the Polish militia the Polish police had uh, organized a campaign to collect da personal data on homosexuals and that was just a decoy because they they, 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 they they said that what they wanted to do is to protect uh, homosexuals against an AIDS epidemic but uh, the ultimate purpose was to blackmail homosexuals and to convince them to cooperate to collaborate with the police and the secret services. And that then Richard Kiesel and his colleagues decided that they have nothing to lose since that campaign was launched. And in contradiction to the uh, people who were mm, panicking and who actually were, had quite dramatic lives, uh, they took the challenge on. They decided to have that they have nothing to lose. They decided to have fun. And every few days they met in... Uh, at the home of one of these people to, and took photographs. It was partly cabaret, pa uh, partly a, um, an erotic or para-artistic, para-erotic um, performances. They had uh, put together a number of pastiches of different aesthetic canons, and later on we will stop and think to wonder where we got that particular, uh, the particular uh, things from. I will try to analyze later on, but now let me show you a, a couple of fragments from that huge collection. I will start with a the opening credits, opening credits uh, that uh, open credits that were placed on different body parts of participants. They had. Uh, um, they were there were puns. Um, not all of them are translatable. Uh, there were four of these guys during those photo sessions. Uh, Richard Kiesel was the author of many of these slogans. But Waldek, uh, who, uh, who was a physical, a blue-collar worker, and also Richard Kiesel's lover, uh, was the main model. But um, if, whereas uh, I was told that uh, had there been, were there, was there any sexual activity involved, that usually happened before or after um, the uh, photo session. Sometimes they had, uh, because uh, Waldek was also Richard Kiesel's um, model. Actually, but there was sometimes some music background or some, some soundtracks and, uh, produced, but most of them were simply stuck in those little boxes and in plastic bags. Uh, I'm just showing you uh, a, sh a small selection. This is what they called uh, the um, trash photos. This is Richard Kiesel, actually. That's the whole team. They picked a number of costumes. Uh, the, there was a whole story about how they got different uh, artifacts, but they also engaged in body art. Um, AIDS was also a light motive because AIDS in 1985 had been one of the intense, uh, very very intense subjects. It was very broadly discussed and important to the uh, gay community, and this is why uh, they decided to focus on it, but they were quite ironic about the topic. You can see a number of backstage frames, uh, in, let's say the making of, so to speak. Apart from that, this collection contains a number of separate mini cycles, outdoor photographies, outdoor sessions. Um, Richard Kiesel photographed his lover um, outdoors, uh, really beautiful photographs, and also a selection of photographs from a nudist beach in Bulgaria primarily, but in other um, Central European locations as well, because Richard, Richard Kiesel 
traveled a lot. Uh, he actually also had his own journal. He um, described the beaches and uh, manifestations and uh, gay clubs that were important to the gay community then, but he had been also a practical participant thereof. This is a very short selection of the f short selection of or from the archive, but that is just an introduction to a conversation we will shortly have with Tomek. Uh, the more I learned about the background of those photographs, uh, the more I learned about Richard Kishel and his work, the more I became interested in the topic itself, because that is not very typical for the visuality or the way of presenting such stories in Poland, but contemporary as well. Uh, Richard Kishel is uh, now more than 60 years old, but he has remained very open, and uh, he talks quite freely about topics that are uh, quite a taboo for his contemporaries and even for younger people. And he talks about uh, sex sexuality with great joy, with no, uh, with uh, without the context of the communist, uh, very grey situation, which had not been very uh, well, not a source of great joy for the uh, gay community of the time. I wanted to put together a project that I dubbed Kisheland. I wanted to introduce Richard Kishel to, to the uh, broader public, but I also wanted to cooperate with him. Uh, you can see this is a contemporary photograph of Richard Kishel, the gentleman on the, on the right. The Kishelland project shall involve a number of, a number of stages, uh, presentations and galleries. We are going to publish a book with the photographs. Uh, but now we are also putting together a film starring Richard, Richard Kishel in the past and contemporarily. Uh, those are actually um, photographs which are no more than one and a half weeks old, so that is a premiere, so to, so to, say, the, so to say the first screening. I invited Richard Kishel to join me in my Warsaw Atelier. We invited a model whose task was to uh, become subject to Richard Kishel's invention after those many years. He is not an artist or not a professional artist, but uh, he decided to become creative again under different circumstances because we have freedom and openness. And I must say that it had been very, very uh, interesting for me to observe his relations with the model and functioning in the artistic sense of the word because we, was, we had a modernistic approach to the atelier in a contemporary setting. Uh, you are going to see that more much more in the film because this is uh, the a series of backstage, the making of photo, uh, photographs. But that was actually about pure expression rather than uh, a purely artistic expression. We wanted to focus on emotions. Uh, we had some erotic tension then there, but also a childlike cre creativity after such a long time. So it, the point was not about the uh, photographs as such in themselves, but the point was to try and uh, answer the question about the final form of the film we are now working on. This is simply an introduction. Now I would want to hand over to Tomek. Uh, and that uh, presentation is going to, uh, to tell you more about the background of what it is that we are talking about here. Those are, let's say, um, notes to the project, let's say, the notes to the project. Uh, that uh, Karol Radziszewski has embarked on. I am not aware of the entirety of the project. I have only seen photographs taken by Richard Kiesel. I have not had an opportunity to take a look at the backstage um, work. Uh, the, my presentation is in uh, English, but I'm going to speak Polish since we all speak, most of us speak Polish here. I wanted to emphasize some contradictions uh, that 
come to our minds when we take a look at uh, Kishel's photographs and project. Uh, they are obviously stemming from the historical and geographical context. I am going to be describing both the historical and geographic context. Uh, in order to clarify the contradictions, uh, I'm going to try and provide you with a historical context, but I'm afraid that not all of these contradictions are going to be described. Um, today, uh, Wolfgang Ernst and yesterday also one of the speakers had been talking about the entropic phenomenon tied in with archives themselves. I do believe that we are uh, facing the risk of a counterfeit presentation specifically when we are trying to tell a negentropic story to overlap a story that is driven by a slightly diff diff different logic. Um, Joanna Mijelinska and Robert Kulpa, my colleagues, have recently published a work entitled Decentering Western Sexualities. And that is a book telling the um, sexuality outcoming and or um, the um, sexual, sexual freedom of the gay and lesbian community. I believe that what Karol is doing and uh, what Kishel, uh, Richard Kishel uh, is doing um, proves the limits to that. I believe that um, there is no such thing as a simple story of the gay liberation. Uh, this is about a private sex party and about an artistic performance. Uh, on the one hand, we have photographs taken by friends, by buddies, by close people, by people who are close to one another, and we also have the aesthetics on the other on the other side. On the other hand, on the one hand, we have a homemade concoction of photographs. On the other hand, we are witnessing the influence of sexual cultures typical to New York or, Lon or London. Uh, Nan Golden and James Bidgood definitely can be considered a source of inspiration and uh, contraband porn because porn had been banned in communist Poland. So we have the local and cosmopolitan sides of the story. That is a snapshot by Nan Golden, um, a stylish photograph by James Bidgood, a, um, a photographic uh, net random uh, from Physique Victorial, a pornographic American magazine. Ex post factum in Latin or Nachtreglichkeit in German, the point is to describe a reality that remains, to, that remains quite unclear even to participants themselves. For example, money shots. Um, money shots. Uh, um, showing uh, ejaculation in, uh, in erotic movies. Um, I was wondering whether money shot was something that was that was known to Kishel. This is a slide that can, can definitely um, lead us to that question. But I do not know whether that is simply not an entropic reading of the archive. On the one hand, uh, Kishel's archive had to remain private uh, for political reasons, for social reasons, for circumstantial reasons. And nevertheless, those, uh, it's, the, it's tied in with the risk of disclosure, of revealing. Specifically, this is something I had been told by Karol before, uh, that those uh, transparencies had to be obviously developed in a, at a commercial studio. He couldn't do that by himself, so he had to take those photographs to somewhere, to somewhere on the in the outside world, in order for a third third party to develop them. With regard to the historical context, the uh, Hyacinth militia infiltration campaign of 1985-1987, ostensibly it was aimed at uh, uh, limiting prostitution and crime in the homosexual community. Um, also, it had been driven at AIDS prevention. But uh, actually, it was that campaign was all about a, a blackmailing uh, homosexuals uh, by the police, um, the so-called pink files, which are now at the Institute of National Remembrance, um, had actually been put together then. So according to the Institute, um, 
no rights can then be violated, so actually no one has access to those files, but historians are not interested, so no one actually deals with those files. The pink files uh, remain a homosexual filing cabinet to this uh, closet, excuse me, a closet. Mm, pardon my mistake, please. So the um, Kishal's point was to introduce a sense of freedom, but also the uh, shedding of the fear of police infiltration. Um, so that was also a way of tweaking their noses at the police and also um, obviously covering any traces, uh, but also leaving a trace behind, a trail behind. Uh, that uh, meant that spelt a risk to participants. Uh, also, I had said before that they were often using commercial studios to develop those photographs. Today, from our perspective, uh, we could uh, refer to that as a gay reaction, queer reaction or a queer commentary to the, um, a panopticon view or perception, if you will. With the co-authors of these photographs, Kishel was actually using the same tools available to the police, that is cameras, photographic cameras, as well as uh, the, um, or not to mention the threat of, of disclosure. The uh, panopticon had been analyzed uh, in their work, and it turned out uh, that despite the fact of the risk being a real threat, it could not, uh, it does not necessarily have to become a brutal reality, and as it happened, it, it had not. So, um, so actually, uh, the, uh, obviously, if uh, they decided to come out of the closet, that could have also, also opened them to blackmail or exposed them to blackmail. Using the uh, police-like methods, uh, Kishel tried to appropriate space that deprived him, him, him of freedom, and that, I believe, resembles a move that would uh, remind us of Juliusz Machulski's 1987 cult comedy King Size, which presents a political and economic system as uh, anachronistic and deprived of, um, re of reality features. It, can, it also, to a certain extent, um, resembles an archive. The film shows a land um, inhabited by, 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 by dwarves, and it's called Droyland, and it turns out to be located in the basement of an, a research institute. Uh, characters are trying to get out of that world to the uh, real world, which is turns out to be a real socialism world and turns out to be a yet another drawer land. Um, you can see sh shots of stills from the movie. You can see the, all the drawers and uh, that's another shot showing you the um, mise-en-scene of the movie. Um, it, the uh, film itself has a beam structure because uh, an escape from Droyland is an allegory to the inability of escaping the world of real socialism. And in that sen sense, um, the contradiction theory is used. In that sense, uh, a certain content is delivered to the beholder, to the audience, in order for the audience to understand the film as a critique of the um, trap that we had all been in for political reasons. And it seems to me that an equally odd or contradictory relationship between public and private is also evident in Kishel's photo shoots. The project, uh, a political project, I believe, <laughs> remained private in the sense that um, the home was a realm of freedom, which is uh, something that uh, was more widespread in Poland, but the homosexual closet here was used as a mm, space of freedom, liberation, and a space for activism or political activity, which involved the risk of exposure. Again, the AIDS context 
As you uh, saw, uh, there is AIDS. AIDS is mentioned uh, or in the uh, photos, and in fact, Philo magazine uh, contains admonitions against AIDS, but they're tongue-in-cheek. And uh, some of the uh, practices, some of the uh, staged sex acts in the uh, photographs, and uh, Karol tells me that Richard Kiesel says that this was his intention. So the idea was to show safer sex. And what the government uh, promoted in public awareness campaigns on safe sex and uh, AIDS, and what's mentioned in Philo and these uh, photographs is uh, consistent. So this is a point of convergence with the official world rather than divergence. So this photograph, uh, like others, might be seen as a commentary on safer sex practices. And it is this aspect of HIV or AIDS uh, prevention shows that there's no single history. We need to realize that there were different uh, histories depending on the place and context. The Polish uh, government was not AIDS phobic as the US government was and as a gay liberation um, narrative claims about the USA. And what we normally understand as risk in terms of AIDS, risk here actually is the risk of public exposure of, um, and not the risk of uh, contracting the virus. In a contemporary context, or recently, uh, Richard Kiesel has been approached by LGBT activists who asked him to um, make available parts of his archive, but they weren't interested in recovering uh, sexual practices or cruising places and so on. And until Richard Tichel handed over the archive to Karol Rozyszewski, the archive remained unknown, although Philo magazine and other things Tichel did were known. I think we are dealing with a certain sexophobia here, because uh, showing images of sexuality or explicitly referring to sexuality does not um, fit in with any desires to create a positive image of the LGBT community. Now, one such example is the fact that drag queens were asked specifically not to take part in the Polish Pride uh, Parade in 2004, even after in the previous year, even, even though the previous year this photograph of uh, drag queens outside the Polish Parliament was the first uh, photo taken from any Pride, any um, LGBT demonstrations that made the Polish mainstream media. Uh, any previously, these were photos uh, from the West, and uh, this being drag queens, uh, they were sufficiently appealing to uh, Polish photographers and Polish uh, media, but then again, drag queens were asked specifically not to take part in the Pride the parade. Then there's official sexophobia after 89, when Le Madame, uh, a club, uh, a space in Warsaw, which had a dark room, was being closed. The owner, the the manager was told by a civil servant, by somebody from the city, that uh, they had a archive of the sexual practices that went on in the dark room, and that was sufficient reason to shut down the club. So this sexophobia was evident here. And uh, then this uh, sexophobia also seems present uh, after 89 on both sides of the political line even among uh, LGBT aid activists to some extent. And uh, briefly, this uh, risk of exposure has not gone away. And uh, besides, archives can be seen as a closet. And there's a difficulty that arises in connection with making this archive available. He Kishel had not um, thrown open his archive, and now Karol's um, job is to figure out how to make that archive accessible. 
because on the one hand the uh, homosexual closet provides some protection for practices of freedom of an effective sexual and political nature and then it also involves the risk of exposure the risk of being misunderstood misinterpreted misconstrued and uh, but there's also the promise of some energy that might be freed with such a disclosure and this uh, liberation this uh, freeing of the effective and political energy might uh, is a potential dimension of this uh, project. And the photographs uh, themselves, in a sense, anticipate and foreshadow these uh, difficulties. They're not so much documentation of action, but action which itself leads to simulated documentation, especially the uh, sex here was uh, simulated. It was staged, but uh, there was a sexual uh, dimension, a sexual layer, intimacy behind the scenes. We know that uh, these four men, the men in the photographs, uh, did have sex, and uh, Valdek, uh, the main model, was uh, Kishel's uh, partner and lover. So there's something hidden, latent, and uh, but the representation does not reveal, at least not explicitly, what had, remains hidden. So, you know, the archive does not contain what the police were looking for, but it does pose a threat because of what it does seem to, what it seems to contain. It's an allegory, in a sense, of how uh, police files operated. Mm, they used uh, blackmail as their main instrument. And it's also an allegory of the homosexual closet because the content of such a closet is always absent, is always questioned. You never know what's in that closet. And once you come out, the contents of that closet are reassessed and uh, their uh, significance uh, changes. And Svetkovic, in an archive of feelings, wrote that the participation of lesbians in ACT UP, the New York um, political AIDS uh, organization, that uh, the participation of lesbians has been neglected, it didn't uh, leave a trace. The lesbians she uh, spoke to sometimes uh, blamed personal embarrassment, uh, some sort of personal reasons. Uh, they didn't want to say how they got involved in ACT UP and what they did. And Douglas Crimp also wrote about the difficulty of uh, connecting affective, mournful uh, feelings, uh, feelings of regret, loss um, of uh, sex, um, that is nostalgia um, for uh, those who passed away, and nostalgia for a sexual culture that uh, also passed away. This is also reminiscent of the difficulties we have with uh, Kishel. The reasons for these erasures, for this uh, skipping over of traces and uh, testimony, um, are, I believe, well, first of all, somebody might not want to bring them out, and then the public sphere might be reluctant to accept them, and thirdly, and this might be the main reason, you don't really know what that means, what to say, what can be said. And I think that a challenge that uh, Karol's uh, project uh, faces is uh, how to ensure legibility, a way of reading the archive. Of course, uh, this would uh, in require us uh, saying more about uh, the Hyacinth, uh, the AIDS campaign, the police uh, campaign, and we also would need to evade today's uh, sex police, as I call them, be they left wing or right wing but also to help or at least uh, prepare the audience to receive, experience the effective energy which uh, can be derived from the opening of this archive. That is, we need to create a frame, a performative uh, situation uh, in which these, uh, these photos can get their uh, proper significance, their right status, in a sense. It would seem 
wykonywać taki ruch, który, który jest and, uh, też performatywny. And Kishil uh, does what uh, might be called a performative uh, gesture, showing that there was, uh, he was self-conscious, he was aware of the situation in which he took the photographs, and uh, Karol perhaps should reenact, although not uh, directly, not immediately, this uh, performative moment. And I think that's necessary if these uh, photographs are to start uh, functioning, gain currency in the public um, sector. And Sven Speaker mentioned uh, access, access in an archive. So we need to create a way of accessing or access. And this is the last slide here. This attempt at uh, presentation inexorably leads us to uh, challenge the simple story, simple narrative. So what we're dealing with is a moment that can't really be placed in the past. It's not consigned to the past. It's uh, both in the past and in the present. And you can't really say that we're more uh, progressive further down the road than uh, the period in which these photographs were taken. And I'd like to ask you, uh, could you maybe tell us a bit more about the way, about the strategy you adopted? Now, uh, could you maybe try and comment on my reading of these photographs, which is, are interesting and relevant because they see, they recognize a moment of closeting, which also has to do with exposure coming out, but it's not coming out uh, in a simple uh, airbrushed uh, kind of way, which uh, raises the various um, sexual dimensions. Yes, it's important what you said about uh, the uh, closeting, the hiding, and the sexophobia. This is uh, typical for Poland. Uh, Poland has not yet undergone a sexual revolution, and this does uh, come back every now and then. And this archive was a closed, uh, enclosed uh, time capsule, and it couldn't really uh, be a broader statement. It couldn't really be heard back in the Day, nor can it be heard now. And uh, speaking about the image of uh, gay activists or the uh, LGBT movement, it's an attempt at uh, concealing, including. So first, we must make ourselves out to be a nice, uh, polite, uh, genteel, politically correct, uh, having nothing to do with sex. It's all political, it's all equal rights, and not even political, but also uh, just equal rights and uh, civil liberties. And the uh, community itself is in a, same, in a sense ashamed and tries to cover up some um, things. And um, Richard Kishel, before I met him, uh, felt that his entire archive, uh, he wanted to uh, hand it over to the Berlin Schules Museum, Museum as the only site, the only, uh, only place that might uh, know what to do with it. The archive doesn't consist entirely of uh, slides, it has mock-ups of the um, layouts of the magazine and uh, press clippings and so on. And I was shocked um, to learn that uh, Kishel didn't know who to give the archive to in Poland, and his, uh, so, and again, he originally wanted to give it to Germany without ever showing it here in the country, without uh, giving anybody the chance to uh, look at it. He's also aware of the uh, value of this record, because uh, when I visited him in Gdańsk, I needed to buy a portable scanner because he uh, didn't allow a single piece of paper to be taken out of his uh, apartment. He felt that he needs to uh, preserve the integrity of the archive. Co też mi się wydaje, że w kontekście właśnie and it seems that in the context of uh, what the gay activists are doing, I mean, oral history is um, seminal, is important, and it's kind of uh, also being neglected given the uh, lack of interest on the part of mainstream historians. And after a couple of meetings with uh, Kishel, we started trusting each other uh, to the extent that he lent part of the archive or let me have part of the archive because I can 
convinced him that it would become visible if it were uh, considered in terms of art, not as part of another scientific archive, an archive where it would be processed, researched um, invisibly, but uh, I wanted to give it prominence, bring it to the fore. And um, the project I uh, have in mind will have a number of layers. It'll be a documentary shown not just in art galleries, but uh, more broadly, and uh, there will be lectures and publications and exhibits, exhibitions devoted to these uh, slides and uh, Richard Tichel himself uh, to um, make him better known, to break out of the uh, code of uh, a PC, peace, politically correct uh, silence, a conspiracy of silence. So would you agree that it's not the case that actually a difficulty or the puzzle, the enigma we're dealing with here is that the context of art is um, proper, appropriate here. What is the subject of these uh, photos? Because you talked about joy, you talked about care f uh, carefreeness, which you uh, contrasted, rightly so, with the drabness of the of communist Poland. And um, the question is um, how, to what extent can we look back, reach into the past and uh, delineate the uh, road we want to travel? And uh, when we were talking about Kishel's uh, photos, you said that you felt this has to do with uh, a creation a rediscovery of your own roots. Uh, so to what extent, really? I mean, how do we approach these uh, photos? Is this an attitude of confrontation? So actually, uh, to what extent are these your roots? Well, briefly, it was an important discovery because I said at the beginning, I showed the first uh, slide and I said that I edit uh, Dick Fagzine a uh, magazine that uh, did not uh, was not well received by the community. Some art uh, galleries uh, did not want to uh, sell it. And then the LGBT community also didn't want to be associated with the magazine because it didn't present the desirable uh, picture of um, the LGBT communities was sexualized and not politicized. So uh, going back to this uh, zine, Philo, in the mid-1980s, was relevant because I wanted an explicit, joyful, um, and subversive sort of, I mean, we don't really, not subversive, um, openness. We don't want to uh, pretend using uh, terms like fag, um, homo, in reference to oneself was then, as it is now, subversive, because the, term, the word queer in Poland itself has uh, uh, an academic polish, an academic element, an academic cachet that uh, includes the subversiveness, and the community itself uh, dislikes terms like fag homo, uh, preferring to the more PC word gay. So at uh, the linguistic at uh, my level, this magazine, this zine was important, but then it was also ironic in its approach to AIDS, as we uh, saw in the work of General Idea, Canadian-American artists, um, where AIDS, even the word itself, uh, was uh, ironically modified aesthetically, and we never had this in Poland, and as we saw in the few slides, the word AIDS, uh, made of uh, Donald Duck stickers, written with Donald Dutch stickers, breaks up the visual code, undermines the visual code that we get when thinking about these uh, subjects. And it also seems to me that a, um, a characteristic trait, a feature of uh, many of your projects is uh, quoting. You often quote uh, other works, you often uh, channel, and it's not just uh, pure unmediated expression, it's also a commentary on what somebody else did. And uh, clearly this is also the road, you're, the way you're going here. It's a um, 
transformation of somebody's uh, work. It's a reiteration of uh, gestures made years ago, such as when you invite uh, Kishel to your uh, studio, you find a model and you uh, let him body paint or uh, stencil the guy. And um, so in terms of uh, meanings in a semiotic uh, sense, what exactly, what kind of activity is this? Uh, is this an attempt at uh, accessing an archive that would otherwise be off limits and illegible? I'd like you to tell, say a few words about the stra your strategy of quoting, of uh, referring to the past. Well, this method of quoting or invoking um, the work of other artists or codes and so on is, um, I suppose, typical for me in projects like uh, the ones which were I transcribed Arno Brecker, and by repeating uh, some of his uh, work, I brought out a homoeroticism that was inconsistent with Nazi propaganda. But um, in this uh, specific case, as we said previously, I uh, wanted to make the archive uh, visible, to bring out its visibility by highlighting its uh, contemporary uh, nature, the modernity, that is, uh, this uh, explicit free open sexuality that uh, contra contrasts uh, with uh, Polish sexophobia. And uh, my efforts to uh, create uh, points of reference uh, to the past, to the present, and uh, looking for parallels is um, are, are meant to create um, a vis visibility and show the subversive uh, nature of these images, not uh, the actual goings on which uh, happened behind closed doors, but uh, the saying that this was this happened in uh, London, this was New York, this was the uh, a rotten um, degenerate uh, East, West, sorry, but all of a sudden we see that in 1985, uh, similar stuff happened in uh, Poland and there's uh, photographs to prove it and uh, so that's perhaps the strategy my strategy where I try to highlight these uh, elements so apart from quoting there's an element of expression that you'd like to uh, liberate perhaps by um, showing these uh, photos in public and I think there's also a performative uh, moment here, in that you give an impulse, you give a meaning to these uh, photographs, of meaning that they wouldn't have, uh, well, first of all, because they were um, obscure and hidden, but also because uh, displaying them out of context as an archive might, in fact, not have the right, might not reverberate. It might be downgraded. It might be camouflaged again, and that's what I'm afraid of. So here, art is a lever that uh, lets uh, you bring it out. Art is a tool that uh, for uh, persons, uh, for professional archivists, um, might be seen as an element of as a chaotic or amateurish uh, element, but it's actually uh, the privilege uh, of uh, art that it can stray, it can grope around in the dark, and that gives it a visibility, a resonance that would not otherwise be possible. We were supposed to uh, get questions, and uh, maybe now is the right time. I, when listening to what you said about uh, these operations on the archive, actually there's an interesting role to be played here by the artist and art in um, doing, in filling in these pockets as Natasha, these um, dark um, sites and corners of history which we uh, don't know what they contain. And this also brings to mind the films of Artur Zmijewski, who uh, uses art as a way of um, forcing a public debate to address uh, things that are repressed, uh, for which there is no vocabulary, even though. But this also, I think, runs the risk 
that when you made such an archive public, when uh, this is done as an artistic intervention or in art, in the realm of art, it won't be seen, it won't be part of uh, universal history, it won't be taken seriously, quote unquote. That is, and that's actually my question, is there, so do you think there's a way, or is it a first step? So ultimately, are you um, aiming at placing this archive and other similar archives in a site, in a dedicated place? So would there be a public institution, and not necessarily, I mean, not necessarily a public institution, um, but a publicly available um, institution that would know what to do with such an archive, or will it always have to be an alternative order, uh, the alternative order of contemporary art? For me, it's a, a matter of how seriously we treat art institutions or galleries. I think that in Poland, as you said, uh, there is this alternative way of uh, seeing art, and uh, it's uh, wrong, really. Um, so I think that in other countries, uh, this is uh, treated in a more equal fashion. Let me begin by saying that in Poland, archives or elements of uh, discourse uh, come up and they're not uh, taken up by um, scientists, scholars, and historians. So these uh, subjects are not to be found in publications and books. Uh, it, not that it's concealed, but it's simply nobody's interested. You don't get PhD uh, dissertations, you don't get academic uh, research, even though you do have access to these materials largely. I mean, this discovery, of course, was incredible. In itself, but uh, there have been other documents which uh, do not uh, interest anyone in the academic community. And as I said, and this might be naive, I believe that the visuality of this archive, and the uh, visibility of this archive, and uh, placing it in uh, an art context uh, will give it a greater chance to resonate and perhaps later to attract interest and attention by theorists who would be able to um, work with it um, appropriately than if it were kept in some dark corners and uh, studied laboratory. So I might be wrong, but it was a natural decision for me to do this. And also, given what we said previously, given uh, the response of the academic community, uh, which uh, focuses, which specializes in LGBT, uh, Pavel Leszkowicz, a curator who knows Ryszard Kisiel, who's uh, done a number of um, exhibitions of gay art or culture, and uh, he never uh, took an interest in this archive. And tomorrow, uh, in Wajnia in Gdańsk, uh, there's an exhibition where Richard Kiesiel will be uh, recalling uh, stories from the past, but which have nothing to do with sexuality. When I see how this has been concealed from the start, I feel that uh, this uh, more decisive and resolved artistic and media uh, campaign or actions might uh, serve to bring out this archive. And besides, I hope that this will lead to a more detailed and more academic uh, research, academic study, once the archive uh, becomes uh, better known, once all the archive is out in public. Um, I think from uh, Thomas Bajuk's contribution, uh, expressively or between the lines, I, I heard that you say some archives should actually remain. Some archives actually should remain closed or disclosed from the public, and this, this, I think, this hits a very important general point in the theory of the archives. I had immediately to think of the Pr Prussian archives, the archives of the Prussian states. As long as this state existed until 1947, they were called the secret archives, which was always the essence of the archive, not to be open, to be secret, to be hidden, to be non-accessible. And only when the Prussian state was dissolved by the Allies, it, be it was returned and it became the historical archive. Then it became histo accessible for historians, for historical research, cultural history, collective memory, whatever it is. But that's not an archive anymore. And I think that's um, 
very important. It's, it, it's very counter-politically correct today because the public discourse on archive is always open access, open archives, etc., etc., etc. But it misreads some of the meaning of the archive. I mean, there, there is. Uh, Schwein Speaker wants to join in. I mean. I mean, yes and no, but let's not forget that it is uh, precisely their secrecy that also integrates them into this dispositif of power. And I mean, we have not talked about power and we have not talked about what really for the first time was, was mentioned in your conversation, which is that archives are, uh, are a, um, a horrific instrument of repression and have always been, and they have been that instrument precisely through their secrecy. So I thought that that in that sense, your, the, this conversation was, was very interesting, and there was another way in which it was, it, it was interesting, and that is that it raised um, another issue that is perhaps in some sense also related to, to the, the problem of the archive secrecy, and that is that archives, apart from their technological um, aspect, they do have this phantasmatic uh, kind of dimension. Yeah? They, there, there, is, there is somewhere a link between archive and desire, and between archives and sexuality, and, I mean, somebody like Don Giovanni in the 18th century must have known that, yeah, when he organized his women in this kind of weird alphabetical order. So um, there, is, uh, there is a dimension to the archive that maybe exceeds the, the, the strictness of the admi administrative regime. Um, and uh, I thought that in that sense also your conversation was very interesting. Dziękuję. Ja może, jeżeli można, to ja krótko chciałbym odpowiedzieć. To znaczy na pewno... Well, um, let me respond. Let me respond from the practical viewpoint. Uh, definitely, where we decide to provide access to the pink files following the hyacinth, a campaign, we would, uh, a number of uh, social and political problems would crop up, something that I had not been talking about also because the issue has not yet become open. But obviously some of the issues described in the files are still alive and people are still alive and some people could actually be blackmailed with the use of those files. Hence uh, the question, natural, the natural question arises, what could actually be said about those files should someone decide to research that? Uh, some historians could decide to do it, but then should they decide to do it, uh, that person would have to definitely ask the question what can be said and about whom, because uh, certain life-related and political consequences might well transpire from the very content of those archives. I believe that uh, the current controversy, the controversy in Germany, stemming from the fact that there are Stasi archives and uh, we do have uh, several dozen people still working there, for, um, and those people had been working uh, working then um, in those archives during Stasi times as well, and that is understandable because they know the ins and outs of those archives. Nevertheless, it is quite controversial, but that also proves the relation, the interrelation between knowledge and life and knowledge and archives. And with regard to what Sven Speaker said, yes, indeed. Not only in terms of the actual content of archives, we are facing something absolutely fantasmatic and tying in with desire. Not only in the sense that archives can contain photographs of the kind shown by Karol Radziszewski, the Ryszard Kisiel photographs, but concealment is a sine qua non condition for desire. I do believe that there is a, this is the dynamics of the, of the, of the thing. Desire only relates to something we cannot yet see or yet touch or yet grasp. And this is why I believe the um, inherent entropy of archives is tied in with uh, archives. Well, obviously there is a difference between the Hyacinth Pink file campaign and uh, providing access to the Pink files is one thing, but access to Kishel's archive is completely another because Kishel wanted his archive to be open. Uh, to be accessible, it tells a story, even if it is only a small history of the thing. But since uh, um, Richard Kichel is alive and wants his archive to become open and accessible to others, 
Mm, I think that this is what should be done. Well, okay, but there is an ar- there are archives who are showing people who are still alive and who might not want to be shown. Well, four people have participated in those photo sessions. Uh, some of them want to remain anonymous, and this is why the Charlotte Kitchen had been the main access of the uh, campaign, but also this is the reason why his is the only name that we fully reveal. If I may, I'd like to offer a commentary. I do not know whether that is going to be a comment or question, but I wanted to uh, simply point something out. That is the need to uh, develop the um, spoken history. Let me uh, quote a good example, good literary example of Lubiewo, based on the same archival concept. A number of interviews had been held by the author of the book, and the book is actually a conglomerate of interviews. Here what we have is a an artistic project that points to a certain invisibility. And uh, the uh, before the archives are shown, this is a project that is going to point out or point to the invisibility of the topic itself. Um, once pink files are opened, that might be different, but I do believe that this project is trying to bring about the, such openness. And this allows us to have hope that uh, in time we're going to open the uh, topic and the community. And I hope that historians are going to realize that as well. I do not know uh, whether you know what uh, Lubiewo is. It is a 2005 book by uh, Michał Witkowski. It has now been translated into English and German, among others. And Lubiewo had been a bestseller in Poland. It is based on a gaze, on uh, on um, memoirs by gays prior to 1990. Uh, and the novel describes a number of adventures, adventures, sexual adventures primarily. It was actually a cultural event in Poland. It had been received broad applause. It had been broadly, um, it had been as enthusiastically received. But, for example, the Krytyka Polityczna, political critique community, that is their room that we are today occupying, they uh, suggested that it was a novel of uh, about the uh, poverty of the retired in Poland. And to a certain extent, they were right. It is a slightly left-wing novel, slightly Marxist. But I do believe that the condition, uh, a sine qua non condition of this, uh, of the the novel being attractive, well, had been to present all the characters of the novel in a slightly quirky way, and this is exactly what happened. In in that particular context, the novel had been discussed. But I do believe that Lubiewo had been well received, uh, and the the attractiveness of gay people had simply become too easy. Uh, The um, audience uh, swallowed it up very smoothly. They decided, okay, that's interesting, but that is not in my in my backyard. You can, We can be voyeurs of the community and draw our pleasure from that. So I believe that ties in with what you are doing, because if those photographs do serve the purpose of uh, coming out, of uh, propagating the uh, Joyous sexuality can also lead to a uh, voyeur pleasure and nothing else. That is the risk you're taking. Yes, indeed, I understand, but I do hope that analyses will follow. But uh, Lubievo indeed 
took on the task of presenting a certain visuality. It had uh, been widely proliferated thereafter, uh, the topic itself. I believe that uh, our society has a lot to learn and way to go in terms of education, sexual education as well, because uh, for the time being, um, our society is not ready for that. Uh, Poles are usually quite monolith monolithic in their way of thinking. They are very, very um, much inclined to distance themselves from whatever they do not understand, and the gay community is one of them. But I don't think that we should be worried too much about the Polish society and their reactions, because otherwise we're never going to move forward.